Well, I'm currently in the midst of preparing this guy for winter. It's looking good. Tires are psyched, everything's ready to roll. And in this video, I'm gonna be putting in a front e-locker in the Dana 30, something I've been wanting to do for years. Given the kind of driving I do on snow, the open diff at the front has always been the weak link. In fact, the rear axle, the Chrysler 8 and a quarter at the back there with the factory LSD has been keeping the train going for a really long time, but it's time for a front locker. This is the locker in question. It's a no-name brand locker. You get quite a lot of stuff with it as well. You get a little bung to put in the diff where the wiring will go through, I assume. You've got shims, lots of different types of shims. You get a switch, obviously. You get cable that you can run into the to the cab and you get it all set up. And some bearings. Um, now, I'm gonna use these as setup bearings um, and I've ordered another set of bearings to go with this. I really owe some thanks at the beginning of this video to a guy called Jonas from Bok Oxeldale in Sveria. Basically, I've been communicating with Jonas for quite a while now and I've been sitting on this locker for almost a year. I did pay for the locker, of course, like it's not paid promotion. I paid what Jonas paid for it. So that's the deal he did for me. And um, he isn't stocking them just yet but he wants me to install it, he wants me to test it, he wants some feedback, he wants to know whether it's worth putting in his shop. His website mostly deals with the drift scene and he makes a lot of stuff for the Dana 30 because a lot of those Volvo rear axles are Dana 30s. Mostly torsion diffs, but one interesting thing is if you are in Europe and you're looking for like parts for diffs for the Dana 30 and you want a torsion diff, he actually manufactures a torsion diff that does a 27 to 30 spline adapter end so that you can swap out the ends for 27 or 30 spline, which kind of works out great for the Dana 30 if you're ever gonna to upgrade to 30 spline shafts and unit bearings. One thing I would suggest is making setup bearings. You can see that slips on real nicely. But I'm actually gonna be using this little thing here, just a bench grinder with a Dremel bit on it. You know, gonna take me about 20 minutes, but just gotta do what you gotta do, right? You gotta use the tools you got. I mean, you gotta use the tool you've got. Are you complaining about things? This is a totally inaccurate way of doing it. I don't recommend it. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> Seeing how much more I need to go. Yeah, so really not that much. It's already starting to, to go on. So this should fit pretty good now. Um, the only thing is, is when you take them down so much that it's better to put them on by rotating them like that. If you just try and push them on, they're gonna get stuck like that. And then you, you won't be able to get them off so easy. Look, that's locked on there. And you sort of want it to be like that. You don't want it to just be totally sloppy Sally going on there, no good. Easy, big boy. I'm loosening you again. Loosening you again. It's doing it. There we are. I'm draining you like it's the first time again, and you're draining me too. But my wallet. Right, there we go. That ain't looking good. I know what you're thinking, that looks really sketchy, um, but it's very safe. Like the problem is, is all my jack stands right there on the four litre. So, you know, I just have to use what I've got. The, the high lift jack isn't actually supporting anything. It's just there. It's like a security measure to, to support the front end of the vehicle. because It's obviously quite heavy. So you've got some good triangulation, but Obviously two bottle jacks, a jack, and the high lift. I'm sure I'll be fine. Hopefully there's no surprises. You're always looking a little bit, a bit crap. So before I get this out, I'm gonna spray it all, clean it, do a backlash check, and do, do I check the gear pattern as well, just so I've got a vague idea of what I'm, what's, you know, what I'm looking for when it's going back in. So that's uh, just over 10,000, so like 11,000. 
so at least I know what I'm dealing with. You know, I've, I've rotated the gear as well and obviously tested it in different places. So about, about 10 thousandths on average. It's got a little bit of gear pace. Looks there's a couple of pubes in there, but I'm not sure what happened. Must have, uh, must have run out of something on the day. But anyway, pop a bit of this on. That was super weird. That bearing just uh, just came off like that. Uh, yeah, really weird. Really don't have the right tools for this, but basically to get the ring gear on, I need to take this thing off. Uh, <laughs> You're not really supposed to reuse ring gear bolts, I and mean, you can do. I've got new ones because I just have a lot of ring gear bolts from when I did a re-gear not long ago. Putting on a ring gear, this is how the pros do it. Just like rotate that, rotate that again, then a bit more. Let's go around again. So I've got to kind of pre-warn you now, if you're going to buy a diff like this, um, or this particular differential, you want to make sure you've got the correct bearings and the correct shims. The Dana 30 shims that go inbound in between the bearing and the carrier are not going to fit this differential. So if you have a look here, you can kind of see that they're just they've got not not got the right internal diameter they recommend you get dana 44 shims apparently from what i've seen online because obviously i've had a look online a lot of people have been installing e knee lockers which is what this is a direct copy of and i had the same question you know i spent time making setup bearings and um the shims that they give you with the kit are outbound bearings as you can see they go on the outer race and that's actually what eaton recommend unless you contact them then they tell you something different apparently they I actually say that their instructions need updating and they haven't done it yet basically i've got some shims that are actually going to work with this if you have a look and i've actually got enough maybe to actually get the correct or, or a decent enough amount of preload on this but it's just something to know before you buy it i mean like it's okay to use outbound shims if you're using big fat ones or you've got a case spreader more often than not if you don't have the right tools like me and this is kind of basically what i'm saying i don't have the right tools um haven't had the right tool my whole life uh but yeah you know you, you just kind of have to make do with it so i'm going to use inbound shims hence the setup bearings i just think it's easier for somebody like me and my kind of installation and i think the diff will be fine i don't want to pretend i've just just popped this in and got it done straight away you know i've been playing around with this for quite a while but you know you can see i've got ten thousandths there which is which is basically what I'm looking for and, and obviously I need to now sort of run the gear pattern because it needs to go back in as close to how it came out as it can, like almost identical really. It's not like I'm installing new gears and I'm going to be burning them in again. You know, this has already been run in for many miles, which makes it kind of a worse job and kind of why you want to really be fitting one of these at the same time as re-gearing, which I didn't. <laughs> Checking it on a different tooth. Yeah, so about 11 thousandths really. So it feels basically exactly where it was before. Pretty dirty way of doing it. So that's the final install with these torqued up. Um, it is different. 
you know, like it, what it, it's, a, it's a bit looser. Mm, I just don't know how I feel about that. It's always flipping different, even if you use the same bearings. You know, it always feels different. It always seems. I mean, that seems f massive now. Well, I thought long and hard about this and uh, walked away from it, as you do. God, there's definitely tons of pubes in this uh, in this mustard here. Like, I don't know what happened on the re-gearing video, but clearly I you know, cortisol levels went through the roof. But you can kind of see now that I've got the backlash within 10, 11 thousandths, basically as close as I can to how it was as it was taken out. I took it to work, pulled the bearing off again, put about three thousandths back in. The preload feels better on installing the diff now. I think this is final install now, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. So I've got to chuck this stink bunger in. It looks like it wants me to drill and tap the case. So, I mean, I, I get why you don't want to nut the other side that could loosen and drop into the diff and wreck it. So I'm going to have to go get a tap and sort that out. Bit of a difficult area to, uh, to get that in, but I've managed to do it in a very dirty way. Um, so I've got some threads in there now to put that bung in. A top tip. If you're doing something like this and you keep tightening it and it doesn't get any tighter, just ignore it. Like now, like you see, it's getting looser and looser. So we just like, you know, we just pretend it's it's fine. There you go. It's just fine. All right. This is so much fun. It really is a lot of fun, though. Yeah, that was good. That was good weld. I'm loving this. Hey, I've got it on my brake discs. Fucking yes! My God, I, I need, I deserve to get a hell. What's happening right now? Absolutely. <laughs> that was a complete waste of time, just completely blamed for it. This has gone fing wrong. Absolutely fing wrong. It's just, this has gone so wrong. Oh. All because the thread just stripped off that little bung it just was made out of absolute shit and now look at it i'm, I'm really annoyed honestly how, how am i going to fix that i don't know how i don't know how i'm going to fix that i can't fix that so i didn't have a lot of luck with that basically i screwed in the threaded bung that you got with it and, it, and the thread just stripped straight off of it off of the threaded bung. So now I've got that giant, great, dirty nip sticking out of my diff. It just it all went horribly wrong, but I had to build another one. At the end of the day, it, it looks sick, but I mean, honestly, I can't even explain how bad that went. But anyway, it's done now. I get this in for the final install now. Try and forget about that threaded bung. It's probably gonna give me a few nightmares. But... Bunkus bunk is my dream. Bunkus smells like beans. I must go out in my dreams. Um, one thing it said in the instructions is you might need to grind down the shaft a bit. And um, when I span this one before, it wanted to pop out. You know, it was binding. The other one seems fine on the long side, but it's obviously a different shaft. Well, I've got everything back together. So oil's in, shafts are in, wheels and brakes and everything back on. Just getting the wiring sorted. So pretty easy wiring diagram in the instructions. It basically tells you where to connect everything. So 
just got to connect up the earth. And also another thing that's really cool, they give you loads and loads of, uh, of cable. Uh, so, you know, I want to run this switch high up, but basically if I push that, the diff should be locked. Let's try it. It's not locked yet. Oh, that's just locked yet. So I guess it needs to rotate a bit. So that's it, locked diff. Wow, that's a big thing. See if it does it in reverse yet. I did, I'm going to go through the firewall. Bit of a mess. I've got a lot of crap going through there. It looks horrific, but, you know, try and keep it clean. Just put some welding wire through. Wrap it around the wire and pull it through. What you've got to do is grease that sucker up and send it home. You know the drill. So it's all wired up. Um, the switch is up there. Obviously, if it was here, my son might jump around in here and switch it on, so that wouldn't be good. But wiring goes along here, down here, in here, and I've just wired it into ignition live. So you turn the key. Switch is now obviously on. Locked. Let's have a look. I've read a few sort of quirky things about these uh, e-lockers. Obviously, probably going to have to rotate it a bit before it finds itself, as you can see. This is one of the things I've kind of read, like people like roll the vehicle around to try and get it to lock. I mean, this is a four pin design as well. So really it should only take a quarter turn to actually get it locked. Now it's locked. And I will say I've got the wrong lubricant in. I've got a real thick lubricant and, and they generally recommend a very thin one, like a Redline 7590, which is what I'm going to switch to once I've broken in the locker uh, that'll be after 500 miles so that's working fine um, obviously if we reverse it another quirk of an e-locker is it unlocks is but all the stuff I'm reading anyway but that seems to have relocked itself pretty quickly you know and, and up to four up to five miles an hour it can be engaged so I guess then you'd roll forward again and then it locks again so it seems to be seems to be working okay actually seems to be working pretty good so the lock is installed. First, I just want to say a big thanks again to Jonas. So, Joska Prata Svenska, Yisni, and Jonas, tusen tack for att du skickade mig lockeren. Um, jag tror det, det är riktigt kul, men ja, jag är sugen på att testa den i snön så men kanske vi kan prata igen slutet på december eller någonting efter snö, snö kom här i Åsalen. Jag kan... Uh, Ja, jag kan berätta dig vad jag tänker på lockaren och sen du kan sälja den på butiken och uh, ja, man vet får se. Men tack igen. Uh, ja, I'm, I'm super, super humbled by that. Um, I appreciate you offering it to me for the price that um, you, you pay for it. So uh, it's given me the opportunity to try out my first locker, which for me is kind of a big deal. You know, I've, I've not had one in the 10 years. I've been rolling around in this thing. So hopefully it's like massively increased the capability of, of that differential of, of the vehicle, really. We'll see how it performs. But um, I've just taken it for a spin. No noise, no heat. So, you know, obviously I managed to put that ring gear back in pretty much similar to how it came out, at least close enough that, that the mesh is happy. I did that re-gear to 488 two years ago. Those gears are well worn in by now. So, yeah, obviously you want to be putting them back in the way they came out, really. Um, so I guess that's why everyone says it's easier to do it when you're putting in fresh gears. Obviously, that would be the smart thing to do, but it isn't always the way life works out but on the locker itself i haven't really touched on the build quality of the locker or really dissected it or taken it apart or shown you how it works and everything e-lockers are really simple um you know that's a four pin with an electromagnetic coupler on it and it locks in and basically the spider the four spider gears on the inside then are locked together and obviously both axles spin at the same time i think as you know in terms of like people's argument that e-lockers are shit and air lockers are king really depends on the environment you live in so most of the guys i've spoke to who do like snow wheeling further north and i spoke to some guys in alaska and some guys in canada all of those guys said do not get an air locker um, because the lines are so small you will run into problems with condensation in the lines freezing and the locker failing to work in sub-zero conditions now i can kind of believe that maybe it isn't the case for everybody but perhaps where I live where you're seeing temperatures 
average minus 15 to minus 35 degrees C and below. That could be, be the case because even my compressor in the back there fails regularly in the winter with um, ice building up in the lines and the compressor freezing. So I have to store the compressor in a certain way to make sure that doesn't happen. So when I air up, I don't basically, I can air up and get home if you know what I mean. So I can sort of believe that. Obviously I think the king of lockers is gonna be something like an ox locker where you're essentially just pulling a lever, pulling a wire and you're locking the locker manually. In terms of the build quality of this one being from China, I don't know, I'll have to test it. And I guess that's why Jonas wants some feedback on it, basically he wants to know how it performs. And, and I guess that's why he's kind of like interested to see how it goes with me in this vehicle. But anyway, off the back of this video, um, I thought I'd just update the regular viewers with maybe what's to come. I know a lot of people don't really care, but you know, it is a channel I run regularly. I put a video out pretty much every Sunday. And um, you know, as well as my OnlyFans account, um, Next week, actually, I've got a visit from Backdoor Barbara and she's coming on to do like a sort of feature length thing on, on the OnlyFans account. account. So um, if you're interested in that, um, the episode's going to be called The Bottomless Pit. There's there's a few more jobs to do on the diesel there. I've got a roof rack to put on it. Flipping super excited. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about that in the next video. That's that's going to be next week. Um, and then and then I just need to finish off the bed platform and then I'm out and about. Um, but uh, yeah, I just thought I'd say a big thanks to everyone anyway for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. It wasn't really a tutorial. It was more like watch an idiot put a locker in for the first time. But you know, it's the real, the reality of it. You know, I'm in this little workshop with basic tools. I get a lot of jobs done, but sometimes I've got to take a, you know, a bit of a sloppy approach to getting things done sometimes, you know, as we all do, right? But thanks to my subscribers, thanks to people supporting the channel. Really appreciate everyone supporting on Patreon and um, I'll see you really soon in another one. Take care.